You know how speed limits change depending on where you are? Well, imagine that your house is inside of a school zone where the speed limit is 25 miles an hour. When you leave your house, that means you're gonna be traveling 25 miles an hour, maybe for the first mile. So we might say that your speed, S, is 25 miles an hour when time T is between zero and one miles. Maybe then you get on the highway and your speed jumps to 65 miles an hour. And maybe you travel at 65 miles an hour between that first mile and the 10th mile of your journey. And then at the 10th mile, you enter a construction zone where you're forced to slow down to 45 miles an hour and maintain that speed from the 10th mile of your journey to the 15th mile of your journey. Well, we can model your speed with a piecewise function that looks like this. And with that, we're gonna cover everything about how to read them, graph them, and evaluate them so that by the time we're done, we understand absolutely everything about piecewise functions, starting with here what they are. A piecewise function is just a regular function that's made up of different rules that define the function over different parts of the x-axis. So instead of one rule that applies to everything like we're used to seeing, if we had, for example, just the function f of x equals 2x plus 1, a piecewise function uses different equations depending on the value of x. Here, f of x is defined by 2x plus 1 whenever x is less than 0, but when x is greater than or equal to 0, negative x squared plus 3 defines the function. But, and this is important, this is still just one function. It simply lives in multiple pieces. We see these pieces when we sketch the graph of the function. So if we just take the part 2x plus 1, we could sketch in the line 2x plus 1 on the graph, and normally that full line would look like this. But because this piece only defines the function for x less than 0, we erase everything to the right of the y-axis so that we only see the part of 2x plus 1 where x is less than 0. Then to complete the graph of this function, we sketch in the graph of negative x squared plus 3, but we only show the part that's to the right of the y-axis because this piece only defines the function when x is greater than or equal to 0. This then, taken in its entirety, including both pieces, is the graph of the function f of x. Remember, we still have to think about this as one function, not two separate functions. It's just one function defined in multiple pieces. So each line of the function tells us what rule to use on the left and then when to use it on the right. This if part on the right, that's the condition. So we always have to pay attention to it so that we know where this rule on the left actually applies. So that's how we read a piecewise function. How do we actually evaluate it? Well, if we want to evaluate at a specific value of x, let's say evaluate this function when x is negative 1, the first thing we ask ourselves is which rule applies. In other words, in which interval does x equal negative 1 fall? Well, does negative 1 satisfy this first inequality, x less than 0, or the second inequality, x greater than or equal to 0? Because negative 1 is less than 0, this value satisfies this first inequality, which means to evaluate f at negative 1, we plug into 2x plus 1, not negative x squared plus 3. Therefore, evaluating the function at negative 1 means we take 2 times negative 1 plus 1, or negative 2 plus 1 gives us negative 1, and the value of f at x equals negative 1 is negative 1. But if instead we wanted to evaluate the function at x equals 0, we look at our inequalities and we see that 0 satisfies this second inequality, x greater than or equal to 0. Which means if we want the function's value at 0, we have to plug into negative x squared plus 3. And when we do, we get negative 0 squared plus 3 or a value of 3. So at x equals 0, the function's value is 3. The key here is that every x value plugs into just one rule of the piecewise function. The only trick is knowing which one to use, and we decide which one to use based on the condition. We figure out which condition is satisfied by the x value we want, and then we use that one rule and only that rule to evaluate the function f. Now, how do we graph these functions? Well, this is where it's easy to start panicking, but if we simply take this step by step, we're gonna do just fine. There are only three steps to graphing a piecewise function, the first of which is to identify the breakpoints. These are the x values where these conditions, where the rule, changes. For this function f, we can see the breakpoint is at x equals 0, because that's where this first rule stops defining the function, and this second rule takes over. Once we identify the breakpoints, our second step is to graph each piece, but only over its domain. So we sketch each graph separately. Like we did before, we sketched in 2x plus 1, but only for x less than 0, and got this little section here of the graph. Then we sketched negative x squared plus 3, but only for x greater than or equal to 0, and we got this half of the upside down parabola. If it helps, you can also break this down into two steps. You can sketch the entire graph, like we looked at earlier with the line, we sketched the entire 2x plus 1 over the graph, 
And then you can erase the part of the graph that's outside of where the inequality defines that piece. So step one is breakpoints. Step two is sketch the graph. And then the last and final step is to check our circles. And this is really critical for a piecewise function. Here, again, we go back to the conditions in our piecewise function, these x less than zero and x greater than or equal to zero conditions, because these inequalities are gonna tell us whether we have an open circle or a solid circle. When an inequality is just less than or greater than without the or equal to part of the inequality, we're gonna have an open circle. And we see that here attached to the line. What this open circle shows us is that this piece, 2x plus 1, defines the function all the way up to x equals 0, but not including the exact value at x equals 0 itself. That exact value, x equals 0, is omitted from this piece, 2x plus 1. On the other hand, when our inequality includes this or equal to, such that we have x greater than or equal to, or x less than or equal to, then we're gonna have a solid circle because that solid circle indicates that this piece, this negative x squared plus three piece, not only defines the function for all values of x greater than zero, but also right at x equals zero itself. In other words, we use open circles for less than or greater than, and we use solid dots for less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. So just remember three steps, identify the breakpoints, sketch the graph of each piece individually, and then check your circles, making sure you've got all your open circles and closed dots in the correct place. Now, that being said, let's talk common graphing mistakes. These are the big three and how to prevent them. So the first one is graphing pieces across the entire graph instead of restricting them to the domain that's given by the condition. So for example, if we had continued the graph of the parabola this way, or if we had continued the graph of the line this way, we wouldn't be restricting each piece to its associated domain. And so we'd be making that first mistake. The second issue is with the open and closed circles. It's really common to mess up where we have this closed dot and where we have this open circle, which is why the last step here in our process of checking our circles is so important. We don't want to make that mistake. We need to make sure that we have circles in the first place instead of leaving no circles at all. And we need to make sure that they're closed or open correctly based on the conditions of each piece of the function. And then the last mistake is leaving weird gaps or overlaps that don't match the condition. So for example, it's really common in a graph like this one to feel uncomfortable about stacking the pieces this close to each other. And so people will instead leave a gap where instead of sketching this parabolic piece here, they'll maybe start it over here and sketch the graph that way, leaving this one unit gap between the blue piece and the red piece. And we just wanna make sure that we're not leaving gaps based on how the graph feels and instead placing each one in the correct domain that's given by the condition here. So we just wanna make sure that we stick to our domain limits and we double check our dots. Now, when it comes to understanding and interpreting a graph, let's take a look at a graph like this one. So piecewise functions often have these jumps, which we also call discontinuities or specifically jump discontinuities. And these happen when one piece ends at one Y value and the next one starts at another value of Y. So this yellow piece ends here and its Y value is negative two. The red piece takes over at the same value of X, but its Y value is positive one. So we have this jump from negative two up to positive one, and that's a jump discontinuity in the piecewise function, and of course those are really common. Sometimes we'll even see a hole or a value that's missing, and other times the function's value exists, but it just jumps like this. But the concept is still the same. We can still capture each piece of the graph as one line in our piecewise function, and as long as we make sure that we define a rule and a condition for each piece of the graph, we'll be capturing the whole function f. So for instance, if we look at each piece of this graph, we can see that this first blue piece on the left here is the horizontal line at y equals negative one. So the rule for that part of the graph would be negative one. What about this yellow piece here? Well, we can see that it intersects the y-axis at negative one, and the slope of the line is negative one because we go down one over one, down one over one. So the equation of that line is negative x minus one, we can see this red piece here is sitting at y equals positive one. That's the horizontal line, y equals one. And then this purple piece here on the far right, we can see it also has a slope of one because we go up one unit over one unit, up one unit over one unit. And if we imagine continuing it down until we meet the y axis, we would follow this diagonal and we would arrive here at y equals negative two. So the y intercept of this line were it to extend infinitely is negative two and therefore 
the equation of that line is x equals negative 2. Remember, that's the rule. If the line extends infinitely, all we have to do is restrict the domain if we're going to write this as a piecewise function. You can see here that we've built the rule for each piece of the graph, except this singular dot here, which is at the point negative 2, 0. What we care about is the y value, just like for all these other pieces. This is y equals negative 1. This is y equals positive 1. This is y equals negative x minus 1. Well, the value here is y equals 0. So even though this is just a dot, we can indicate its value as 0. And then if we're actually going to write the piecewise function from the graph, we've already figured out the rule for each segment, and we just have to define the domain or the condition for each rule. All we do is work our way from left to right. So starting with the blue piece here, the rule is negative 1. Then we move to the green circle. The rule there is 0. The rule for the yellow line is negative x minus 1. The rule for this horizontal red line is y equals 1. And the rule for this purple diagonal line here is y equals x minus 2. So we put in all of our rules. And now we just define each condition. Well, the condition for y equals negative 1, or f of x equals negative 1, we can see that that piece runs all the way up to this line here, x equals negative 2. But that open circle right there means that x equals exactly negative 2 is not included, which means we define that condition as x less than negative 2 instead of x less than or equal to negative 2. This singular dot here, since it's a closed circle, since it's a closed dot, a solid dot, that means the function's value is defined there at exactly x equals negative 2. So we would write that as x equals negative 2. And then again for the yellow piece, the function's value is not defined at exactly x equals negative 2, nor is it defined at the next breakpoint, x equals positive 1. So for this rule, we write the condition as x between negative 2 and positive 1, but not at exactly either endpoint. So not at exactly negative 2 and not at exactly positive 1. The red piece picks up at x equals 1 and extends to x equals 2. So again, we'll have an inequality where x is defined between 1 and 2. But the solid circle tells us that that piece defines the function at exactly x equals 1. And the open circle on the right tells us that it doesn't define the function at exactly x equals 2. So we have x greater than or equal to 1, but just less than 2. And that's where the purple piece picks up and defines the function for x greater than or equal to 2 because of the solid circle that's attached to this purple segment. So just think about this like building a puzzle backwards. We break the piecewise function into segments. We figure out a rule for each piece, the negative 1, 0, negative x minus 1, 1, and x minus 2. And then we just assign the correct domain to each piece and build out the piecewise function one line at a time. So with all that in mind, let's do a real world example, because these functions do, of course, appear in the real world. Let's say we've got a taxi company or a rideshare service that's charging by the mile, and maybe they charge $5 for the first mile and $2 for each mile after that. So the cost is going to depend on how far we've gone, how many miles we've traveled. So if we sketch that, our sketch would start by looking like this, where for the first mile, so between a distance of zero and one miles, our cost is $5. If, however, we go over one mile but stay under two miles, then the cost of our trip is going to be that $5 plus an extra $2 for the second mile. And so anywhere in that interval, our cost for the ride will be $7, and the cost will continue to step up each mile that we travel. So we could start this way, but now we need to think about what happens at each of these breakpoints. Well, if we travel exactly a distance of zero miles, in other words, we don't travel at all, we don't even take the trip, then our function isn't even defined. So we leave that circle open. But if we start moving, if we go even 0.001 miles, now the cost of our ride is immediately $5, which is why we have this horizontal line here. But what happens at this breakpoint at x equals 1? Well, if we go exactly one mile and not a single inch further, then the cost of our trip is still going to be $5. So we have a solid circle here at the end of the first segment, which means then at exactly x equals 1 on the left side of this second segment here, we're going to have an open circle and then a solid circle at exactly two miles. So we can add in circles for the second segment and we would continue on that way, adding the same pattern of circles to each segment in our graph. Then the question just becomes, how do we write this as a piecewise function? Well, maybe we call the function capital T of x for the cost of our taxi ride. And what we would say is that the first rule here is 5 because the equation of this line is y equals 5. The equation of the second line is y equals 7, then 9, then 11, then 13, and so on. 
Now, what about the condition associated with this first rule? Well, five defines the function between zero and one, but not at exactly zero and at exactly one, which means the condition there is x greater than zero, but less than or equal to one. And then we could keep building our piecewise function by saying that the cost of our taxi ride is defined by seven, this second rule, when x is greater than one, but less than or equal to two. And we could keep going that way. The function's value is nine when x is between two and three, but we're saying greater than two and less than or equal to three, that its value is 11 when x is between three and four, but greater than three and less than or equal to four. And then because this is a predictable pattern, we could end the definition with just this dot, dot, dot to show that the definition of this piecewise function continues indefinitely. So now we know what a piecewise function is. We know how to read it and match up each rule with its condition. We know how to evaluate a piecewise function by finding first which condition the x value satisfies and then evaluating that function just at the associated rule, making sure we're always only evaluating one piece based on which condition fits our x value. We know how to graph a function step by step by first looking at breakpoints, graphing each piece individually, and then double checking our circles to see whether each one should be open or closed. We know how to interpret discontinuities in a piecewise function and how to build a piecewise function based on its graph. And we know how they show up in real life. So they might look weird, but they're actually pretty logical once we get used to the rules and understand that each line of the function is really nothing more complicated than a matching rule and condition. If this video helped piecewise functions finally make sense and you want to keep building on that understanding, I've got more practice and lessons waiting for you. Just click the link below to head over to my Algebra 2 course when you're ready to dive in.